Mount Rainier, standing majestically at 14,417 feet, is not only one of the highest peaks in the contiguous United States, but also a beacon for outdoor enthusiasts, especially those who find solace and adventure in the embrace of nature. Known as Tahoma to the tribes who have rich histories intertwined with the mountain, it has become a scenic haven and a challenging terrain for hikers and climbers alike. While the mountain may not rival the heights of Mount Everest, it demands respect and caution, offering a rigorous test for those who dare to traverse its paths. Nestled in the heart of Mount Rainier National Park, this mountain has been a popular climbing destination since its first documented ascent by P.B. Van Trump and Hazard Stevens. But today, let's delve into a different story. One that revolves around Eric Lewis, a 57-year-old experienced climber who embarked on a daring journey up the mountain, a journey from which he never returned. Eric, a seasoned climber who had successfully summited Rainier at least 10 times prior, chose to ascend via the Gibraltar Ledges route, a path not typically recommended for summer climbs. On July 1st, Alongside his companions Don Storm Jr. and Trevor Lane, Eric began his ascent, undeterred by the challenges that lay ahead, on a day when the mountain was perhaps best left alone. This tale is not just a story of Eric, but a reminder to all adventurers who seek the thrill of the outdoors, that while the call of the wild is strong and enticing, nature is a force to be reckoned with, demanding respect preparation, and caution. So, as we explore the vast, beautiful terrains, let's carry with us the stories of those who ventured before us, finding inspiration and caution in their tales, ensuring that our adventures are not only exhilarating, but also safe. The Gibraltar Ledges, a route on the formidable Mount Rainier, presents a climb that is not particularly daunting when undertaken during the optimal months of December, January, and February. However, embarking on this journey in July brings forth its own set of challenges, such as loose rocks, less compact ice, and other potential hazards, making it a significantly more treacherous climb. On July 1st of 2010, these conditions were notably harsh. Visibility was reduced to a mere five feet in some areas and the winds howled fiercely at 40 to 50 miles per hour. Despite these perilous conditions, Eric and his companions decided to attempt the climb, a decision that, in hindsight, proved to be a monumental mistake. Typically categorized as an intermediate alpine climb with a grade 2 difficulty, the Gibraltar ledges may not seem exceedingly challenging to the seasoned climber. For context, a grade 2 climb, while not considered difficult, does encompass elements such as snow and slopes with steep 50 degree gradients. The route demands the use of crampons, axes, and ropes, with additional gear like helmets being highly recommended. Eric, with his usual climbing gear, which included his backpack, crampons, an axe, his helmet, his ropes, was seemingly prepared for the ascent. The route, which ascends approximately 9,000 feet and begins at the elevation between 4 and 5,000 feet, is not merely a hike, but a vertical journey, almost two miles straight up into the sky. This is a venture that introduces risks such as elevation sickness and significant temperature drops, especially when attempted outside of the recommended season. Despite the daunting and hazardous conditions, Eric, Don and Trevor, tethered together by a rope, with Don leading the way, pressed onward. The climbing strategy involved Don making progress upward, pausing to allow Trevor to catch up, who would then wait for Eric before continuing their upward journey. They managed to reach an elevation near 14,000 feet, a mere stone's throw away from the peak, when they realized something was very wrong. They realized Eric was no longer attached to the rope. His footprints, which were visible up to around 13,800 feet, mysteriously disappeared without a trace of direction. 
The immediate response from Don and Trevor was to search their immediate vicinity, checking any area within the reach of the rope. Their search yielded no clues, no footprints, and no signs of Eric. A sense of urgency set in, and they descended to Camp Muir, situated at 10,200 feet, to seek help from the rangers. A search team, led by climbing ranger Tom Payne, was promptly dispatched, reaching the summit around 8 p.m. Despite their thorough search, they found no trace of Eric. The following morning, a more intensive search was launched, involving 40 searchers, both professionals and volunteers, on the ground, and helicopters equipped with infrared technology circling above. One team of climbers found Eric's backpack at 13,600 feet and an ice cave at about 13,800 feet, roughly where Eric was last seen. However, the backpack was not inside the ice cave, as some versions of this story might suggest. The other teams, searching various routes and areas, found no further clues to Eric's whereabouts. On the fourth day of the search and rescue mission, a team ascended Emmons' route and traversed, heading to Ingram Glacier. Yet, Eric, the climber who had mysteriously unclipped himself from his rope and companions, remained missing. Despite the meticulous search, all that was known was Eric's backpack was located at 13,600 feet. A snow cave was identified at 13,800 feet, and Eric was last seen nearing 13,900 feet. No footprints or sign of his whereabouts were discovered beyond these points. On the third day, rangers skied down the Gibraltar Chute, a ski route that spans from 12,650 feet to 9,600 feet, and another team scoured the Nisqually Glacier, southwest of the Gibraltar Chute. Both teams sought signs of a fall or struggle, yet found nothing to indicate Eric's path or fate. As the search continued, several questions lingered heavily in the air. Why did Eric unclip himself from the rope without signaling distress or communicating with his companions? Why was his backpack deliberately left at 13,600 feet? Was the snow cave at 13,800 feet of any significance to his disappearance? And if so, how? The absence of tracks or signs of struggle and the lack of evidence in the snow cave only deepened the mystery. If Eric had experienced a medical emergency or been attacked by wildlife, signs of a struggle, distress, or blood would have likely been evident, but the mountain yielded no such clues. The search was eventually called off due to high winds and incoming heavy rain. The disappearance of Eric on the Gibraltar ledges of Mount Rainier has left a perplexing mystery that echoes through the trails and peaks of the mountain, inviting contemplation and caution among seasoned adventurers. Where did Eric go? Despite the exhaustive search efforts, which scrutinized every possible alternate route and crevasse, Eric was nowhere to be found. The searchers, well aware of the potential dangers of the crevasses due to past incidents, meticulously checked each one, yet Eric remained elusive. If Eric had fallen into a crevasse, it was not a long and expected route, and if he ventured elsewhere, why were there no footprints or other evidence to tell the tale? This mystery deepens with every possible explanation seeming to contradict itself. If Eric was in danger, why was there no signal for help? If he suffered a medical emergency, where was his body? If foul play was involved, what was the motive and where was the evidence? And if Eric chose to disappear, why would he abandon his backpack containing survival gear at such a high altitude? While some speculate a cover-up suggesting that his friends may have harmed him and concealed his body, the lack of motive and evidence makes this theory as perplexing as the others. The possibility of Eric being shoved into the snow cave or his friends leaving his backpack does not align with the available facts and observations in this case. In the absence of a perfect explanation, the outdoor community, particularly those with an interest in hiking, exploring, and mountain climbing, are left with a bewildering story that intertwines with the tales of Mount Rainier. 
Eric's story, while shrouded in mystery, serves as a stark reminder of the unpredictability and respect demanded by the great outdoors. It underscores the importance of preparedness, communication, and caution during every adventure, ensuring that while we seek to conquer peaks and traverse trails, we remain ever mindful of the inherent risks and unknown presence by nature's vast creations. Eric's unresolved disappearance stands as a somber tale, prompting us to navigate each journey with an unwavering respect for the elements and a commitment to safety and solidarity among our fellow adventurers. Amid the awe-inspiring landscapes of our country's untouched wilderness, a puzzling trend has left both park rangers and detectives scratching their heads. Each passing year, they witness a concerning rise in the number of people vanishing within the sprawling boundaries of our revered national parks. These vast terrains, while offering moments of tranquility, thrill, and unmatched wonder, also set the stage for enigmas that cloud the destinies of those who dared to tread their paths. While some of these mysteries can be chalked up to mishaps, confrontations with wild animals, or the unpredictable elements, several remain inexplicable, sparking rumors of hidden forces or concealed threads beneath these idyllic sceneries. Are these incidents grounded in logical reasoning, or do the terrains conceal enigmas beyond our grasp? Fern Baird, a 63-year-old from Park City, Utah, led a prosperous life juggling her roles as a realtor and a yoga bag business owner. Her kin fondly remembered her as a nature enthusiast who occasionally enjoyed life's leisurely pace. However, a seemingly ordinary day hike in Idaho's Sawtooth National Forest on October 19th, 2020 took a mysterious turn. Fern never made her way back and since that fateful day, her whereabouts remains a puzzle. Records show that Fern checked in at the Prairie Creek Trailhead around 1 p.m., but never checked out. Intriguingly, trail logs revealed the presence of a group of five hikers around the same time, but their identities remain elusive. Fern's note indicated her plan to trek to the lake and back. Yet, three days post her hike, her prolonged absence raised alarms prompting a massive search operation involving multiple agencies and resources. Despite these efforts, the only lead was her parked Subaru Crosstrek. With no subsequent financial or phone activities, Fern's trail went cold. While some speculate she might have ventured towards the various lakes in the vicinity, extensive searches yielded no results. Blaine County Sheriff's Office expressed interest in connecting with a couple from Boise on a group from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who might have crossed paths with Fern. As time lapsed, theories emerged, suggesting Fern might have succumbed to injuries or the elements, yet concrete evidence remains elusive. To this day, Fern's fate remains a mystery. A reward of 25,000 stands for any information leading to her whereabouts. Fern, a white female with brown graying hair and brown eyes, was last seen in a light gray jacket dark attire, and a dark mask. Those with potential leads are urged to reach out to Lieutenant Mike Abade at the Blaines County Sheriff's Office. Garrett Barsley, a 12-year-old with a passion for baseball and outdoor adventures, embarked on a Boy Scout camping trip with his father on August 20th, 2004. Their destination was the scenic Uinta Mountains, situated within the Uinta Wasash Cache National Forest. The group, consisting of seven adults and 18 children, was buzzing with excitement as they ventured into the forest. After setting up their camp, the group, including Garrett and his father, headed to Cuberant Lake for some fishing. The path from the campsite to the lake was a short 150 meters. During their fishing session, Garrett's clothes got wet, causing him discomfort. He sought his father's permission to return to the camp to change. His father gave him directions and Garrett set off. However, this would be the last time anyone saw Garrett. A short while later, his father, sensing something amiss due to Garrett's prolonged absence, began searching for him. Despite the efforts of the entire group and later the Summit County Sheriff's Office, Garrett remained missing. The once joyful campsite was now filled with tension and worry. 
A massive search operation was launched, involving over 200 volunteers and multiple search and rescue teams. The only clue they found was a damp Nike sock near the campsite, which Garrett's mother identified as his. However, its ownership was later disputed by a searcher. Nine days after his disappearance, with no substantial leads, the official search was called off. The prevailing theory was that Garrett had lost his way and succumbed to the elements. Yet, in 2009, a twist emerged when a woman reported seeing Garrett in Nevada. Despite this potential lead, no concrete evidence ever surfaced from it. Garrett was described as a white male, light brown hair, hazel eyes standing at 5 foot and weighing 105 pounds. Distinctively, he had a birthmark on his right forearm. On the day he vanished, he wore a black quicksilver pullover, reversible Nike sweatpants, and a white t-shirt, Nike ankle socks, and white Converse shoes with stars. Anyone with information about Garrett is encouraged to reach out to Lieutenant Alan Sidaway of the Summit County Sheriff's Office. In late 2017 to early 18, 24-year-old Jerika Binks was making strides in her recovery journey. She had willingly checked into a rehabilitation center and was showing positive progress. As part of her healing process, Jerika had developed a passion for running, often covering distances of 10 to 15 miles. Additionally, she had started self-defense training, equipping herself for any potential threats. On February 18, 2018, Jerrica, dressed in her running attire, informed her roommate about her planned run and left the center. Surveillance cameras later spotted her on the Timpanagos Cave Trail. This was the last confirmed sighting of her. Given the structured environment of the rehab center, her absence was quickly noted and her mother was informed. However, due to administrative errors, the police investigation faced delays. It took eight days post her disappearance for a full-fledged search to commence. Investigators deduced that Jerrica had ventured into a section of the park that was off-limits during the winter. Despite challenging weather conditions, search teams, compromising of volunteers and officials, tirelessly looked for Jerrica. A photographer who was in the vicinity on the day of Jerrica's disappearance reported hearing gunshots and stumbled upon an oddly arranged campsite. However, no direct link between these observations and Jerrica's case was established. The mystery took a tragic turn in April 2019 when a hiker discovered skeletal remains in a remote ravine. The challenging terrain where the remains were found was not a typical hiking spot. By April 17, 2019, authorities confirmed the remains to be Jerrica's. The exact cause of her death remains uncertain, though it is believed to be accidental given the severe leg injury she had sustained. The circumstances leading to her presence in such a remote location remain a puzzle, with many questioning whether it was a mere accident or foul play was involved. On April 5, 2012, 65-year-old William Bill Anthony Ott was last spotted when he was left near the Mohawk Canyon in the Hualapai Reservation, located within the Grand Canyon National Park. Bill had embarked on a three-week solo trek across the park and reservation. Given his extensive hiking experience, his friend and family weren't initially worried. Bill had prepared well for this journey, carrying sufficient supplies and a GPS tracker. However, it remains unclear if the GPS data was ever utilized by authorities to trace his whereabouts. As the month of April concluded without any sign of Bill, anxiety grew among his loved ones. Bill had chosen to leave his phone behind, relying solely on his GPS for navigation. By May 10, 2012, with no word from him, he was officially declared missing, prompting a search and rescue operation. During the investigation, potential witnesses were identified who might have seen Bill. Some reports suggest that a river company or another group might have spotted him near the Colorado River. While the sighting remains unverified, those familiar with the park theorize that Bill might have been seeking food or water or a park ranger's assistance. Another theory proposes that Bill might have tried hitchhiking towards the Flagstaff region of the park, though no hitchhiking reports support this claim. The mystery of Bill Ott's disappearance continues to haunt his family, friends, and investigators, all of whom hope for clarity on Bill's fate. Bill, a white male, 
with brown hair and blue eyes, stands 5 foot 10 inches and weighs around 180 pounds. He was last seen with a gray backpack featuring a black top and blue accents. Anyone with relevant information is urged to reach out to the Coconino County authorities. The first snowfall of the year is usually a beautiful and joyous celebration in the small ski town of Mammoth Lakes in California's Eastern Sierra. But the early October snow in 2013 was disheartening for the searchers of a missing Pennsylvania man. Hope was fading with the inevitable change in season and those close to him were starting to understand the grave reality that he may never be found. From more than 2,500 miles away, his loved ones experienced a tug of war between despair and optimism, feeling helpless across the country as they went through the motions of their daily lives. Three months earlier in July, the 39-year-old high school math teacher dropped his car off at a mammoth auto car shop for repairs. He was visiting the area for a summer climbing vacation when the car blew a head gasket. The friends Green was traveling with headed home and Green planned to drive to Colorado to join other friends for more climbing as soon as his car was ready. I may have to spend the rest of my life here in Mammoth, he texted to a friend as he got more and more frustrated with how long the repair was taking. He was anxious to get on with his trip. No one has heard from Green since he last talked to his parents on July 16, 2013. He did not tell anyone his plans for the following day. He never picked up his car. His campsite was left tidy, and his credit cards and phone have not been used since. Matthew had a habit of ripping out pages from a guidebook as to where he planned to hike instead of taking the entire book with him. When he returned from a hike, he would replace the missing pages as a trophy of sorts. The only clue that was found was a few pages torn from a mountaineering guidebook, and this pointed toward the Minarets and Ritter Range in the Ansel Adams Wilderness. At the time, Mammoth Lakes was experiencing sunshine and above average temperatures. On July 29, 2013, Matthew Green was reported missing, and his body has not been found in the years since. In 2013, more than 600,000 Americans were reported missing in the United States, according to the FBI and National Crime Information Center. At the end of the year, nearly 85,000 of those cases were still active. At the time he went missing, Matthew Green was the only unsolved missing person case in Mammoth Lakes, and in January 2014, Reed's family filed for a death certificate in Pennsylvania. But the case is still open with the Mammoth Lakes Police Department. Most people assume that Matt was a victim of some sort of climbing accident, a fall of some sort, said his friend John Greco, that met him in California. But all his friends agreed that he was experienced, skilled, and careful in the mountains. Born on September 8, 1973, to Robert and Patricia Green, Matthew is the second of four children. He grew up in rural Pennsylvania, developing a love for the outdoors from a young age. He was a Boy Scout and often went hunting and fishing with his dad. Growing up in the boondocks of Franklin Townships was a blessing. Green wrote in 1999 in a letter to his sister, Tiffany Minto, when he was in the Peace Corps. I came out of there with independence, a love of nature, and a determination to succeed in school, life, or whatever. When they were kids, Green would take Minto fishing and target shooting at the lake, where they'd stay until bugs feasted on their arms. They went hiking together often, even in the really cold winters common to the northeast. The ice didn't slow him down one bit. I struggled to keep up, Minto said. Green loved to run, competing on the track team in high school and running the Boston Marathon a few times as an adult. As the student speaker for his high school graduation, Green urged his classmates to take chances. The time has come to fulfill our current goals and to set new ones to be conquered later. In our future travels and endeavors, no matter where they take us, we must not use our youthful imaginations. We must not be too scared to take risks, and most of all, we must live life to the fullest. Matthew said in his high school graduation speech, 
Green went on to study at Clemson University in South Carolina before transferring to and graduating from Penn State University. As a Peace Corps volunteer on a teaching assignment in Papua New Guinea from 1998 to 2001, he regularly wrote letters to her sister, giving her advice on life, college, and relationships. Any associations you have in your life can be lumped into one of these three categories. People who push you forward, people who drag you down, and people who do neither, he wrote. He also wrote to friends, telling tales of his adventures like walking six hours to fix a radio transceiver in a hiking tour, which was a nine hour trek across dense brush and mountainous terrain, where he found himself crossing a roaring 100 foot waterfall waiting for shallow rivers, carefully walking, and descending countless valleys. In his letters, Green not only gave accounts of his work and explorations, but he also contemplated life and its greater meanings. He wrote, It's a pitiful thing when people reach the point in their lives where passionate inclinations in their lives no longer win out over regular routines. I don't know why our minds always gravitate towards reason. It's a nuisance. At least for me. It takes a lot of mental effort to give in to his passions. But once I've devoted myself to them, I'm never plagued with regret. When he returned from the Peace Corps, Green got a job as a high school math teacher in Pennsylvania and would go on summer climbing trips to fulfill his needs for adventure. He often traveled out west solo for camping, hiking, and climbing occasionally meeting up with friends along the way. In 2006, he road tripped through South Dakota, Wyoming, and on to Red Lodge, Montana. When his car broke down at the end of the trip, he tooled around town and hitchhiked to a trailhead. In his trip log, he wrote over the course of a few days, I put in an awesome 10-hour hike. The rock was surprisingly solid, yet some big pieces moved. I returned to find that rodents had torn into my engine plug wires, vacuum hoses, and mostly wire sheathing. I coasted into town and took my car into the shop. They should get to it tomorrow morning. The next day, he wrote, same as yesterday, no car yet. Hitched a ride out to the bear track and hiked up the silver plateau. It's awesome up there, good mix of pines and open fields. More reading, more net searching, coming up with a plan. Yellowstone, climb Tiwanot, Wind River Range, ring the bells, maybe the Great Sands Dunes, and Long's Peak, then home. Still waiting on that car. Green arrived in Mammoth Lake a few days before he met up with his friends John and Jill Greco on June 28, 2013. He set up camp at New Shady Rest Campground on the edge of town and paid for July 7th. John, Jill, and their nine-year-old son checked in at a hotel nearby. Over the next 10 days, Green and John climbed many of the region's classic routes, places like Crystal Crag, Clark's Canyon, and the Gong Show Crag. They also hiked a few of the Eastern Sierra's classic alpine routes. Green kept a handwritten log of his climbs, sometimes elaborate and other times brief. He often checked and reported conditions on websites. During this trip, he wrote on Summit Post, Did the V-notch on Saturday, July 6th. We easily crossed it via a snow bridge. We studied the route well for signs of rockfall before committing and only had one baseball-sized rock rocket down during our ascent. Tons of rocks were falling the U-notch. During Green's time in Mammoth, his Subaru was in and out of the auto repair shop. It would get fixed, then overheat, driving up a steep grade and go back to the mechanic. It was finally diagnosed with a blown head gasket, which would take additional time to repair. On July 7th, John and Jill were scheduled to leave Mammoth Lakes. John had a work meeting in Southern California the next day, and Matt planned to leave for Colorado to meet up with some other friends. That morning, the whole group hiked to Emerald Lake in the Mammoth Lakes Basin before Matt continued 
up the trail to the Mammoth Crest and John and Jill headed down to their car to begin the drive. It was the last time any of Matt's friends would ever see him again. As we were walking down the trail, I say to my husband, you know, he goes off like this and he doesn't tell anybody. If something happens to him, nobody will know where to look, Jill said. Her husband said, yeah, and the bad thing about it, that his car won't be at the trailhead. Even though Green had planned to leave that day as well, his car was still in the shop. He was fine being stuck in Mammoth. It's not like he was in the middle of some remote backcountry area. There were shuttles to take you all over the place, and he thought it was only going to be a couple of days. Over the next eight days, Green continued to climb classic Sierra peaks and routes, checking in with John and Jill by text message every few days. On July 8th, Green soloed Regal Huff Minaret, a 10,560-foot spire in the Ritter Range west of Mammoth Lakes. On July 9th, Green headed north to climb Dana Kowar, a popular 1,200-foot ice route on a 13,000-foot peak near Yosemite Park's entrance. Later, he sent John an update. The Regal Huff Minaret took less than 6.5 hours round trip, but was scary, and the Dana Kowar was easy, but fun, and had the best ice of the trip. July 10th was a rest day. On July 11th, Green took the shuttle to Red's Meadow Valley to hike and climb in the Minarets and Ritter Range again. On the ride to the trailhead, he spoke to a Devil's Post maintenance worker. They talked about climbing Mount Ritter, Banner Peak, Clyde Minaret, and the cross-country hikes between the Minaret Lakes. Matthew was not sure of his itinerary for the day when he got off the shuttle at the Devil's Post Pile Trailhead, but he eventually climbed the 12,280-foot Clyde Minaret, the tallest of the Minaret's jagged peaks. From July 12th to the 15th, Green hiked the cross-country route on Mammoth Crest, and he climbed Unicorn Peak in Yosemite's high country. On July 16th, he went to the Mammoth Lakes Library to use the internet. He called his parents and the mechanic, then sent a few text messages and made a small purchase at Rite Aid. He paid the campground for the night and the next day. Since Jill and John left Mammoth, they continued b t texting back and forth with Green every few days. Jill updated him on details for a trip to France they were tentatively planning later that summer, and John received updates on the climbs Green had done. Jill grew concerned when Green stopped responding to texts. At first she didn't think anything about it. Then she called him, and her husband sent him a text. Again, they didn't hear from him. On July 21st, after three unpaid nights, the host at the campground reported the abandoned campsite and suspicion of a missing person to the Mammoth Lakes Police Department. Two officers responded to the call, visited the campground, and recorded the information on a police log. Campsite number 164 was left intact, but Green had not returned to it. His neatly folded laundry was stored inside the tent along with some gear. His food was in the bear box. MLPD Detective Dung Hordback said, We can't really do a whole lot unless a missing person report is filed. We'll get a name and the information, we'll put it on the log, and that's as far as it goes at this point. So the campsite was broken down, Green's gear was put into storage, and new campers soon occupied the site. On July 26, Green's mom expressed concern that she hadn't heard from Matt. She'd been leaving messages that went unanswered. But Green often went on long hikes and backpacking trips and didn't return messages immediately. Sometimes it would take him days or weeks to readjust to society after a good trek. He enjoyed the solitude of the wilderness and was not into technology, so his sister Minto brushed off his mom's concerns. She said he probably couldn't charge his phone or was spending some time in the backcountry. 
They knew that Green could not use his car phone charger because the Subaru was still in the shop, so she thought maybe his phone was dead. Still, she knew that his lack of response was unusual, and she grew increasingly concerned when she didn't hear from him for 10 days. John called Tony, Green's friend, that he was planning to meet in Colorado to see if Green had arrived. Maybe he was spending time in the backcountry, Tony suggested. On July 29th, seven days after Green's campsite was packed up and put into storage, Jill called the Norco Goodyear to inquire about his car. She was told it had been ready since July 18th. Green had not responded to a message saying the car was ready, and he had not picked it up. Jill then called the Mammoth Lakes Welcome Center and talked to a ranger. She asked for someone to check on his campsite, and the ranger insisted she file a missing persons report. Thirteen days after Green disappeared, he was officially reported missing. Green was no stranger to climbing mountains. His list of ascents logged on Summit Post read like the resume of an experienced mountaineer. His friends said he was skillful on ice, calculated in the outdoors, and did not take risks. More than two weeks after Green talked to his parents for the last time, Detective Hornback contacted Verizon for an emergency information request. Verizon concluded that Green's phone had been powered off for quite some time, and there was no and there was no way to track the current location. The last ping was registered to the cellular tower on Mammoth Mountain on July 16th. According to Detective Hordbeck, the ping created a cone-shaped triangle with towers in Fresno and June Lake, indicated that Green Phone was located within that region, which consists of mostly of the Ansel Adams Wilderness. The Mammoth Lakes Police Department did not find any evidence of foul play, and the possibility of suicide was quickly ruled out. Green did not have any financial trouble. He was single and showed no signs of depression. When the Grecos last saw him in Mammoth, Jill said he was as normal and optimistic as he normally was. On July 31st, Detective Hornbeck notified Bill Green no relation at Mono County Sheriff's Search and Rescue. Typically, when a person is reported overdue in the mountains, SAR launches an investigation. They are quick to respond and have a healthy roster of volunteers that are experienced mountaineers, but Matthew Green did not tell anyone where he was going. And his car was still at the mechanics, so they didn't even have a trailhead to go from. Without a known location, SAR could not begin a search. Matthew Green could have gone anywhere. Most of his equipment was stored in his car, which was parked outside the Norco Goodwear while waiting for repair, meaning he had access to his per personal belongings 24 hours a day. From an inventory of the equipment left in his car and tent, friends were able to deduce what he was carrying with him. He was probably wearing a blue outdoor ball cap, a black t-shirt over a long sleeve green shirt and mountaineering approach shoes. He had a large black and white mountain hardware backpack, an ice axe, black diamond crampons, and was either carrying or wearing boots. He did not have overnight gear. Since he had no vehicle, Green's only option to get to trailheads was to either walk, hitchhike, or public transport. With a number of local shuttle services, which Green had used in the week prior to his disappearance, he could have made it to a number of trailheads, from the Mammoth Lakes Basin to Yosemite Valley. From the guidebook found in his belongings, Chapter 12 was torn out, which included Minarets and June Lake. With the shuttle to Red's Meadow, Green could have been at any one of three main trailheads in the valley that leads to a network of paths that access the trail ranges in the wilderness. The 231,533 acre wilderness area is located west of Mammoth Lakes and the Sierra Nevada Crest in Madera County. It shares a border with Yosemite National Park to the north and the 581,000 acre John Muir Wilderness to the south. 
The region is popular for hiking, backpacking, and climbing. The mountain range is vast and rugged. Even though SAR could not launch a full-on search without a known destination, they sent teams to the Minaret region on training missions. They checked summit registers in the range, and a helicopter team did a flyover. Detective Hornback worked with the U.S. Forest Service to contact people with overnight wilderness permits for the region. If anyone spoke with Green on the trail or shuttle or gave him a ride, they have not come forward yet, or they do not know he is missing. Green's family hired an aerial tour company to fly over the region. They mounted a red digital camera to the wing of an old Piper airplane. The camera is capable of recording high quality images at 30 frames per second while being zoomed in at 3x. They recorded 100 gigabytes of data that was later processed and examined, but showed no evidence of green. Detective Hornback followed up on every single tip. Psychics from around the world called with information after looking into a crystal ball or having a dream. A retired police officer in Minden, Nevada reported a sighting of a young man that fit the description of Green at a Nevada gas station. A woman said she had given Green and his dog a ride to Colorado, but Green did not have a dog. Glasses were found near the Inyo Crater's trailer head less than 10 miles from Green's campsite, but the prescription did not match. The police talked with campers in the lakes adjacent to Green's. They interviewed the employees at the auto shop. No one had any concrete information. What frustrated them the most was that he was so experienced, but he didn't tell anyone where he was going. There's nothing wrong with sending a text and saying, hey, I'm going to go climb in the minarets today. That would solve a lot of problems. Detective Hornbeck said, Green's sister began compiling facts and information, creating a Find Matthew Green Facebook page. She did interviews with reporters. Friends started forum on climbing websites seeking information. Conversations were started and theories were tossed around. Where would Matthew Green have gone? The MLPD press release was published in the local papers. Media outlets in Pennsylvania picked up the story and a short news brief made it Los Angeles Times. What makes the minaret so appealing to climbers is also what makes the Rubbit Peak so dangerous for climbing. The Ritter Range is located within the Sierra Nevada, just west of the crest. The jagged landscape of the minarets and sharp summits of Mount Ritter and Banner Peak can be seen from all over Mammoth Lakes. The range stands tall and mighty, separating the Sierra from the rounder mountains in the coastal range. Unlike the granite that makes up much of the Sierra, the Ritter Range is metavolcanic rock, which was formed in several volcanic super eruptions, according to Alan Glasner, professor of geology at the University of North Carolina and author of a book about the geology in and around Yosemite. These eruptions produce hot volcanic rock deposits that flow much like an avalanche. Metavolcanic rocks are generally kind of sketchy for climbing because they flake apart easily and are not nearly as strong as granite. That's why they form spiky landform like the minarets instead of big smooth cliffs like Half Dome. It's been years since Matthew Green disappeared from Mammoth Lakes, and still no trace of him has surfaced. In August 2014, his campground neighbors returned to the area and saw a missing person sign. They called the police department and met with Detective Hornbeck and Bill Green from Search and Rescue. They said they invited Matthew to go for a hike with them, but he declined. He did not say or they could not remember where he was going. Since Green was carrying an ice axe and crampons, Mount Ritter is a logical guess for his destination on July 17, 2013. The Southeast Glacier is the most prominent snow route in the range. The trailhead is accessible from public transportation, was in the chapter of the guidebook that he was carrying. 
For even the fittest of mountaineers, climbing Mount Ritter in one day is a huge feat and the hike is seven miles one way. And then it is another 4,000 vertical feet of off-trail hiking and climbing to reach the summit. At the time of Matt's disappearance, I had a pretty strong suspicion that he had gone to Mount Ritter, but after reflecting on it and revisiting the area last summer, I am not so sure, said John Greco. I don't think the climb itself would be particularly appealing to Matt. It seems like somewhat of a slog with limited technical challenges. Green did not have any unknown pre-existing medical conditions and an animal attack is doubtful as no evidence were ever found. There has never been a human death by mountain lion or black bear in the region and grizzly bears haven't been there since the 1920s. It seems likely that Matthew Green had a fatal climbing accident. Maybe he would have set out to climb the region's tallest and most prolific mountain on his last day in the area, but there is no hard evidence. If Matthew Green hitchhiked like he had been known to do in the past, he could be anywhere. And since he had climbed in the minarets a few days prior to his disappearance, it is possible that the chapter of the guidebook was still in his pack. But there was enough suspicion that multiple search parties focused on the minarets and the Ritter Range. Green's close friend and climbing partners went to Mammoth Lakes to search in August 2013 and a number of local climbers and mountaineers have spearheaded their own small search parties in search of Matthew. Dean Rosna, a former SAR officer and member, has spent nearly 30 days searching for Green. In August 2013, Rosna focused on the minarets. But late that summer, he began to gravitate toward Ritter and Banner. In a search area so vast, what we are looking for is so small, one will literally have to step on the evidence to find it, Rosnoss said. A lot of gear has been hauled out of the wilderness areas that surround Mammoth Lakes, but none of it has been identified as Matthew Green's. The unknown and lack of resolution is part of a grieving process unlike any other. When the snow started to fall in 2013, the search came to a halt and the missing person posters were taken down for the season. The family petitioned for and received a death certificate in Pennsylvania so they could settle his affairs. There has been no memorial service. The hardest part is the not knowing, said his friend Tom Davidock. If he had let someone know where he was going, we have a completely different situation. But you can't get mad at him. We've all done it. Green's closest friends and climbing partners each say they don't climb as much as they used to. And most of them can't really explain why, other than the disappearance of Matthew. There is a lingering feeling of disappearance and sorrow that just dampens their enthusiasm. Greco hasn't done any mountain climbing since Matt disappeared, with the exception of the searches that they did for him. He can attribute it to a lack of partners, work, and family responsibilities getting in the way, but in truth, I just haven't been motivated to make it happen, he said. In 2014, Green's father, Robert, spent the summer in Mammoth Lakes. At 69 years old, he was slightly overweight and out of shape, but he began training so he was conditioned to hike in the high sierra he wanted to spend the summer in the mountains where his son is presumed dead and he hiked nearly 700 miles that summer he explored the trails that matt had enjoyed he searched with rosnaw and he climbed for the first time greco led robert up crystal crag so he could stand on a summit that matt had also stood on in the year prior Green's mother wanted him to get a taste of the kind of climbing Matt loved to do most so he could hopefully understand the appeal and attraction. She just kept thinking about how Matt would have enjoyed watching his dad climb, something I'm sure he never would have considered doing before Matt's disappearance. Green's mother, Patricia, visited Mammoth Lakes that summer for the first and only time for one week with her daughter. Not a hiker. Patricia spent most of the time in town, while Minto hit the trails with her father. 
She felt completely at peace and in awe of the beauty. But turning home just felt like she was turning her back on Matt and the possibility of finding him. She wished she could move on, but it's just impossible. To this day, no trace of Matthew Green has ever been found. What do you think happened to Matthew Green in the mountains? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this content, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. It really helps me provide this content to you and tell the stories of the missing.